According to the 18th chapter of Acts, Luke tells us that Paul established the church in Corinth during his second missionary tour around 51 AD. And he lived with them for a year and a half. This was a change in his tactics. Prior to this, he would go to an area, establish a church, and move on almost immediately. But he had such a negative experience in Athens um, that he uh, decided to park for a while in Corinth uh, and, and develop the church a little more um, deeply. Uh, Corinth had a reputation of being sin city in the ancient world. Um, a Greek historian named Strabo, or Strabo, writing about the time of Christ, said that the temple of Aphrodite in Corinth had over a thousand sacred prostitutes. Most scholars think that he was uh, fabricating that whole thing. Murphy O'Connor says in terms of sexual morality, Corinth was really no worse than any other Mediterranean port. But it was a port, but you know what sailors do on the shore leave. Uh, nevertheless, its reputation is perpetuated in the Greek language because um, Corinthius, I, I can't pronounce that, uh, uh, that means fornication. <laughs> Okay. And Corinthia core means the prostitute. So that reputation did get sort of uh, enmeshed in the Greek language. Uh, what we know uh, as first Corinthians is uh, at least Paul's second letter to the church. How do we know that? Because in first Corinthians he says, I wrote you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. So we think that that first letter got lost. So 1 Corinthians is really a second letter, just to confuse you further. <clears throat> and by the way, it makes logical sense when you read them that 1 Corinthians was written first, but the reason that it's called 1 Corinthians is because it's longer. Right? When they took all of Paul's writings, they arranged them longest to shortest. Romans is his longest letter. 1 Corinthians is his second longest letter. 2 Corinthians is his third longest letter. That's the reason that they're arranged in the Bible that way. And the reason they're named is not necessarily the date of writing, but how long they were. Opposites, but whatever. It's not like Paul dated any of his letters. Okay? Because, let's face it, he would have to date it based upon a Roman calendar because there wasn't a Christian calendar yet. Uh, tradition dates 1 Corinthians to about 56 or 57, written from Ephesus during Paul's third missionary tour. And the reason he's writing to the church is to address conflicts which had arisen within the community of faith. I know it's hard to imagine that a community of faith would have conflicts and internal divisions. But apparently the church in Corinth did, and that's why he's writing to them. Paul learned about those problems from three sources. First of all, from Chloe's people, or it's been reported to me about you, my brothers, by Chloe's people, that there are rivalries among you. We think that Chloe was probably uh, involved in trade and sent delegations to Ephesus, and they kind of filled Paul in on that. Uh, secondly, 1 Corinthians is an answer to a letter that the church wrote to Paul. Now in regard to the matters about which you wrote. Okay. And thirdly, Paul learned about the problems from the delegation that arrived from Corinth and probably took the letter back to them. Now we have to understand the purpose and the nature of this letter in order to interpret it correctly. This is not a theological treatise. That's what Romans is. But 1 Corinthians is a pastoral letter. 
Paul considered himself to be not only the founder of the church in Rome, uh, in Corinth, but its pastor. He refers to himself as their father. Raymond Collins puts it this way, his letter should be seen as a pastoral response to a community beset by a variety of problems. Paul does not engage in philosophical discussion per se, rather he deals with the community and its issues in a practical manner. Now I'm sure he's not in here, but if Dusty were here he would agree with me uh, that the most challenging sections when putting together a talk or a series are the beginning and the end. You know, setting the stage and drawing conclusions are key to effective communication, and that's true in ancient letters as well. And so we're going to find that what Paul says at the beginning of the letter tells us what he's, where he's coming from, what he's talking about, and what he says at the end of the letter gives us a key to interpreting what's in the middle. And that's certainly true with 1 Corinthians. Most commentators cite 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, as the topic sentence for the letter, where he says, I urge you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and in the same purpose. Paul's main focus in 1 Corinthians is the disunity of the church there and identifying its causes and addressing it directly. And he comes back to that over and over and over again. The Greek word for disunity is schismata. Okay? And a schisma is literally a rip, like in a rip in a piece of cloth. His appeal that they be of the same mind suggests that they have a they must have a similar understanding of Christ if they are to be a single community, the church of God in Corinth. Now this letter can be a challenge to study uh, because Paul addresses many issues and at times it's hard to know when he is taking up a new topic. Most scholars, uh, most scholars believe the key to understanding 1 Corinthians, remember how I said that he gives you a topic sentence and then he gives a conclusion, and that conclusion tells you how to interpret everything that's in the middle. And most scholars focus on chapter 15. Chapter 15, specifically Paul's discussion of the resurrection. Now, while the crucifixion is a vital component of God's eternal plan of salvation. For Paul, it was the resurrection that validated all that Jesus had said and done. This is very similar, for instance, to that uh, wonderful scene in the Gospels where the friends lower the paralytic through the roof. Okay, And Jesus says to him, your sins are forgiven. <clears throat> And the scribes all go, who's this guy? I'm going to say that your sins are forgiven. And he says to them, what's harder to say? Your sins are forgiven, which you can't prove, or get up and walk, which you can't. And he says to the paralytic, get up. And he gets up. So if he can do the one, he can do the other. All right? For Paul, the resurrection validates everything that Jesus said and did. If, if, if it were just the crucifixion, well, good people die for bad people all the time. So not all the time, but it's not unusual. Okay? But it's the resurrection that places God's stamp of approval on what Jesus has done. Uh, so let's read what he has to say. And that's why I told you you really didn't Bibles because I have them all on the screen. Okay? Uh, that way I don't have to flip back and forth. Let's see what he has to say in, in, in chapter 15. First says, But if Christ is preached as raised from the dead, how can some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? 
If there's no resurrection of the dead, then neither has Christ been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then empty is our preaching, empty to your faith. He goes on. For if the dead are not raised, neither has Christ been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is vain. You are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep, that's a used visit for dying, those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are the most pitiable people of all. If our faith is limited to what happens in this life, it is worthless. And finally, he says, but now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead came also through a human being. For just as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be brought to life. M.T. Wright says this, if the Corinthians will only grasp the way in which God's new age has broken into the world through the death and resurrection of Jesus, and the fact that they have been summoned to live in the new age rather than in the present evil age, most of the issues addressed in the letter will fall into line. They need to grasp the meaning and the centrality of the resurrection. They need to understand that they haven't arrived yet. That we live in the in-between times between Christ's first advent and his second advent. That we have been saved, sort of. We have the promise of salvation, but we haven't achieved it yet. We live in the almost nearly not quite hardly. And that's the tension. Okay. You see, the issue at Corinth, you, you can read this wrong, but the issue at Corinth was not a denial of Jesus' resurrection. It was a denial of believers' resurrection. That was the issue. He's, he's using a Jewish way of arguing, but nobody there denied that Jesus was resurrected. They just don't buy into the idea of us being resurrected. And that has several implications. Apparently, uh, there were some within the Corinthian church who believed that they had already arrived. That they had already received all the benefits of Jesus' death on the cross. But they were saved. To them, the resurrection of the body was just a euphemism for having received the Holy Spirit. Thus, Paul's three-chapter discussion of spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14. They were actually using these spiritual gifts to compare each other, see who was more spiritual. Okay? Because they had already arrived. Um, the belief that you had already arrived has several uh, ramifications. Uh, there is little reason to pay attention to what you do with your body. Okay? And we have to remember the society they lived in. Luke Timothy Johnson puts it this way. He says that the, that the uh, Corinthians have collapsed the delicate tension between the already and the not yet by regarding themselves as already being rich and ruling in God's kingdom. But for Paul, salvation is a future event, a future finishing up of what God already begun in Christ. Believers are not currently saved. They are on their way to salvation. We're going to discuss that in much more detail in next lecture. So don't ask me any questions today about that, because I'm going to get off. I do have a question. 
Did they believe in the resurrection of the body? Did they believe the soul would go on? We're going to get to that. Thank you for that wonderful transition. We're going, we're going to get to that. You're, you're speaking like a Greek there, not a Jew. I just want you to know that. Okay? We're, 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 com we're coming to that. Okay, this is how Bart Ehrman puts it. He says this, wrongly thinking, that they have already experienced a spiritual resurrection with Christ. They have come to devalue the importance of the human body and its activities and have failed to realize that they are still living in a world controlled by forces of evil. Now there are several challenges to studying 1 Corinthians. First and foremost is Paul's use of maxims. You know what a maxim is? Does that ring any bells? Well, in algebra, we would call them axioms. Okay? But in philosophy, maxims are truisms. They are statements that society takes as truthful without any proof or justification. Maxims like, well, boys will be boys. <laughs> That one's kind of thrown out the window with the Me Too movement, don't you think? Or how about what goes around comes around? That's a maxim. And Paul uses them throughout the letter. You don't refute maxims. You either modify them or you offer alternatives to them. Let's look at an example. Paul writes, Everything is lawful for me, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is lawful for me, but I will not let myself be dominated by anything. Now, that's, that's exactly how it appears in the New American Bible. Do you see these quotations here? Everything is lawful for me. What's the problem? New Testament Greek didn't have any punctuation marks. Okay? It was just one letter after another after another another. There's no spaces between words or sentences or paragraphs. There's no punctuation at all. So when the New American Bible Committee puts quotes around there, they're just guessing. They're editorializing. And it makes a lot of difference whether Paul is quoting somebody else or he is making a statement in answer to their questions, right? That's the challenge, is when is he doing like this, and when is he not? Uh, by, as an aside, I just wanted to point out that at the very next verse he says, the body, however, is not for immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord is for the body. Obviously, is speaking to this idea that it doesn't matter what I do with my body, I've already arrived. Okay? The interesting thing about it is that the word soma, which is translated body, appears over 30 times in 1 Corinthians. Need I say it? If it's repeated, it's important. What's interesting is that Paul has a play on words. We don't have time to go into this, but Paul has a play on words in meaning body. It may mean this body, and he may be referring to the body of Christ. Okay? He talks about both of those, and it's an interesting interplay there. And what is he talking about this? When is he talking about that? And that gives scholars a lot of work to do. Keeps them busy and out of trouble. Um, Okay, here's what we're going to talk about, You're about your point. Uh, the whole idea that we think of today about I have a body and a soul, that is not New Testament, that is not Jewish, that is not Paul. That is Greek philosophy creeping into Christianity later on, years, centuries later. Here's what Paul Sampley says about that. It was later Christianity, after Paul, and no longer depended upon him, 
that fell into thinking of human beings as composed of body and some more valuable inner spark that might be termed soul or spirit. But redemption is not the salvaging of some inner, perhaps purer essence of the individual. It is the saving of the whole being. And that is precisely why in the creed we profess belief in the bodily resurrection, the resurrection of the body. It's not just this kind of thing inside of me that is kind of like spiritual spark. It's all. Okay? We were, now, our resurrected body is going to be completely different, just as Jesus' resurrected body was different. He could walk through locked doors and, you know, and still be able to eat fish and never have figured out how that happens. But, okay. But it will be a bodily resurrection, just as Christ had a bodily resurrection. Okay, this is what Raymond Brown has to say about these maxims. He thinks they were originally either coined by Paul and then distorted by his critics, or they were imported by his critics, and really wasn't what he had to say in the first place. Um, They believe that the body is unimportant, both as to what one does in the body and what happens after death. So that's the first problem, is the use of maxims. The second problem has to do with this. In, in chapter 7, Paul changes course. First he talks about what's interested, what he's interested in. Okay? Chapters 1 through 6 is what Paul's talking about. That's disunity. And then he turns in chapter 7 to what they wrote about. Okay? And he's answering their letter. The problem is, we know the answers, and we don't know the question. It's like Jeopardy. Okay? We know his answer. We don't know what the question was. We have to guess at what the question is. And that is the quicksand of 1 Corinthians. For instance, the very next statement he makes is, it is a good thing for a man not to touch a woman. And actually, in previous classes, I've had people take five minutes to come up with three different questions that that would be the answer to it. And to show, we know the answer, but we really don't know what he's talking about there. Because you can take that out of context and apply it all across the board. In fact, I would tell you that chapter 7 of 1 Corinthians is a minefield for misinterpretation. Here's an even stranger one. What will people accomplish by having themselves baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, then why are they having themselves baptized for them? Have you ever heard that? Did you know that was in the Catholic Bible? It sounds like Mormons. Okay? What amazes scholars is that he says it matter-of-factly, he doesn't condemn the practice, and he never comments on it at all. Chances are Paul and the Corinthians knew what he was talking about, but we don't. We don't have a clue what he's talking about. That's the only time in any of his letters he mentions baptizing for the dead. Okay. We have to remember, we have to keep this constantly in our focus, is that Paul wrote 1 Corinthians relatively early in his ministry. relatively early in his ministry. And that's why when he says, are you bound to a wife? I love that term. Are you bound to a wife? I say that to my wife. <laughs> bound? Are you bound to a wife? Do you not, do not seek a separation? Are you free of a wife? Then do not look for a wife. Now, is he talking to us in the 20th century there? Is he addressing any common problem we have today? Well, no, we have to see that in light of the fact that Paul and the church expected Jesus to come back next week. Okay? We call that an imminent parousia, the, the Greek word for the second coming. Okay? Paul expected Jesus to come back next week, which would explain why 
he would say all of these things in chapter 7. To the unmarried and to widows, I say, it's a good thing for them to remain as they are. Everyone should remain in the state in which he was called. I tell you, brothers, the time is running out. From now on, let those who have wives act as not having them, for the world in its present form is passing away. Obviously, if that's your mindset, that's going to affect the way you address the problems. Our problem is we don't live with that expectation, most of us. We have 2,000 years between time of writing and time of reading, and we have to be very careful not to fall into a trap because 1 Corinthians chapter 7, throughout the ages, not just in America, but certainly here, was used as a justification for slavery. Because in that same chapter, Paul says, were you a slave? That's supposed to be when. When called, do not be concerned about it. Even if you can gain your freedom, make use of your present condition now more than ever. In whatever condition you were called, brothers and sisters, there remain with God. And there's plenty of evidence that that was used um, as justification for slavery. Well, Paul said it was okay. Paul told the slaves not to run. Um, which brings us to our third challenge, and that is the issue of proof texting. Let me tell you what proof texting means. Uh, a, a proof texting is basically, this is what I believe, now I'm going to go find a scripture that supports it. And, and, it, and it can be a scripture, but more often it is pieces of scripture. Maybe half a verse here and a word here and this sort of thing. And the worst people about that are the left behind series people. Okay? Anybody who's into premillennial dispensationalism does this all the time. But the church doesn't let us do that. We can't pick and choose which verses we believe and base our beliefs on. We have to view the entire totality of Scripture, and that's what brings up some issues and some real lively debates, which we don't have the answer to. Let me catch up with my notes here. Now, and don't think that the Catholic Church is immune to that. I have heard more than once this statement from 1 Corinthians 7, I should like you to be free of anxieties. An unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But a married man is anxious about the things of the world, how he may please his wife, and he is divided. Now, what do we use that as proof text for? Priesthood. Priesthood celibacy, right? Is that what he's talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 7? No. It may be the answer he would give, except that when he's writing this, there were no priests. There was no pastor of the Catholic Corinthian church. That's why he didn't write to the pastor of the Corinthian church, because there wasn't one. Okay? So that's not what he's writing about. It may be true, but we can't say, well, Paul said, and be accurate about that. And that's true on a lot of issues. If we're going to take Paul in chapter 7, literally, then we have to be consistent about it. And that would leave these instructions for Mass. Any man who prays or prophesies with his head covered brings shame upon his head. But any woman who prays or prophesies with her head unveiled brings shame upon her head. For it is one of the same thing as if she had her head shaved. So if we're going to say, well, Paul advocated priestly celibacy, then we're going to have to say, well, women, you can't come to church without your head cover. Which kind of sounds Muslim, doesn't it? <laughs> okay. Notice something else. You notice here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul assumes that this is happening. Paul assumes that women are prophesying and praying at the church worship service, right? Well, then what do we do with later on, he says, as in all the churches of the holy ones, women should keep silent in the churches. For they are not allowed to speak, but should be subordinate, as even the law says. But if they want to learn anything, they should ask their husbands at home. 
or is improper for a woman to speak in church. You see how he almost kind of seems self-contradictory here? We have to be very careful that we don't just pick and choose parts of 1 Corinthians to base our belief system on. We've got to see it in the totality, not only of just this letter, but of all of Paul's letters. Otherwise, it's just a minefield. It really is. Dr. Wall? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, why, I guess, unless I miss something, why the contradiction and why is, what's his goal? I mean, he's assuming this is going on. Where did this come from? Yeah, but by both parts. I mean, why is, why did he write such? Why was it an issue? Contra- yeah, why the contradiction, both of those? You know, within his letter, there's a lot of the, like you said, the Right. Well, you know, the first thing that scholars do when they encounter something like this is they say, well, Paul didn't write this. It was put in by a scribe later on. There probably is some validity for that. He is addressing issues that did not occur until after he was dead. Okay? It was very common in the ancient world for somebody to write in the persona of somebody else. That was was not considered plagiarism or lying. It was just the way you did things. We're actually going to discuss that in, at length in our third talk this spring, so stay tuned. Okay. Uh, here's another problem with proof tests. No, 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 sorry. Uh, let, let's call, let's move on to what I would consider the major issues that Paul talks about in First Corinthians. One commentator says this. I I really like this. He says, no one disputes that the Corinthians are a contentious carping bunch of themselves. <clears throat> Contentious carping. That's not a real good description of your local church, is it? But that's apparently what's going on there. Luke Timothy Johnson says this, they tended to define themselves by their differences rather than their common life. Does that sound familiar? Are we still doing that? We focus so much on our differences and not the vast majority of things we have in common within the church and within. Now, in their society, status was of paramount importance. As Sampley writes, he says the most important cultural norm in Paul's time was the attainment of honor and its equally powerful counterpart, the avoidance or at least minimization of shame. The attainment of honor, the avoidance of shame, is their most primary cultural norm. What is ours? Make money? I would agree wholeheartedly with that. The attainment of things. The bigger your bank account, the better off you are. And in some quarters, it's a sign of God blessing you because you're doing the right thing. Boy, that's a little quicksand, too. Mm. Um, The second issue that he deals with is defining the community of faith. The word Adelphoi, translated brothers, occurs 38 times in 1 Corinthians. Need I say it? If it's repeated, it's important. On the other hand, the Corinthians are brothers in name only. They do not share a common vision. A couple of examples. In chapter 5, Paul chides them for allowing a man who was having intimate relations with his stepmother to remain in the community of faith. That is, they were allowing outside norms to penetrate into the church, the community of faith. Do we still face that issue? They haven't changed a lot in 2,000 years, have they? So we allow outside norms to penetrate 
into, within, well, out, things that are tolerated in society can become tolerated within the community of faith, even if they are destructive to that community of faith. But even the individual versus community. In chapter 6, he addresses the opposite issue. Chapter 6, he chides, uh, uh, in chapter 6, uh, he insists that disputes between believers should be resolved within the community of faith rather than resorting to pagan judges and courts. He's convinced that believers should be able to work out their differences with one another amicably with a sense of fairness and responsibility. What do you think about that one? Having just served on a jury, I can tell you that our legal system is as broken as our health care system. <clears throat> Would it not be better to somehow resolve our differences within the church? Luke Timothy Johnson says the community was failing precisely because the boundaries between the world and the church were collapsing. Another idea. Murphy O'Connor suggests that the church, the church cannot fulfill its mission unless its behavior is distinctively better than that of society. You can't be a beacon on the hill if you just fit in with the crowd. Come right on in. Another issue is individual rights versus community benefit. Almost without exception, when Paul identifies a conflict between the rights of the individual and the greater benefit for the community, he chooses the latter. He also insists that faith must be expressed within a community of believers. And I, I don't know, I, I really don't know about the whole business with the ascetics and with people going out into the desert, the desert fathers and that sort of thing, but I don't think Paul would look kindly on that. Here's what uh, Samley says. Never anywhere in any of his letters does Paul imagine the life of faith as lived in isolation. Individual edification is all right, but not ideal. Faith without community may not be completely bogus, but it's not the real thing. No proper relation to God is possible without others in support and others who benefit. The, the trite way of saying that is that there's two pieces of the cross and you can't have one without the other. Okay? That, that our faith is both our individual relationship with God and our expression of that in community. And if you're missing one of those, you don't have genuine faith. Okay. There is, however, I would point out, a difference between unity and uniformity. Uh, in his encyclical Evangelii, Evangel I kind of like have trouble pronouncing Latin. Evangelii Gaudium, is that right? This is what Pope Francis says. He says, it is the Holy Spirit who brings forth a rich variety of gifts, while at the same time creating a unity which is never uniformity but a multifaceted and inviting harmony. Finally, probably the most critical issue that he addresses is how do you live out your faith in a pagan world? Now even though Strabo's comments about Corinth's reputation are probably exaggerated, there is no doubt that theirs was a heavily pagan society, one which would inevitably lead to conflict between deeply held beliefs 
and societal expectation. As Collins puts it, the Christian is challenged to maintain a faithful commitment to the one God and the one Lord, even as he or she maintains a wide variety of commercial and social relationships with people of different cultures and with people of different or no faith. We face the same issue today. That is what I would go to First Corinthians to seek out. Yes, Paul's telling us how you live out your faith in a faithless world. Paul consistently connects behavior with belief. I think it would be safe to say if you believe it and it doesn't translate into the way you live your life, it's not going to benefit you. He doesn't separate life into spiritual and secular, religious and the rest of life, Sundays and the remainder of the week. All of life equally and fully is under the dominion of God, and every aspect of one's being is placed in the service of God. His overriding concern is that the Corinthians be the holy people of God that God has called them to be. By the way, I chose intentionally not to put any pictures up here for that. Not to give any examples of how you live out your faith. Because that's individually determined. We must each ask the Holy Spirit, how do I translate what I believe into what I do this week? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I think I would add to your examples. It's just business. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and we should not hide behind that. I was just watching stuff on Enron last night, so that really comes to mind. <laughs> What did she say? You can't behind, hide behind the phrase, it's just business. I mean, Ebenezer Scrooge did that, right? Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, okay, we simply don't have time to delve into specific examples. Perhaps that would be a good future Bible study. <laughs> Book it. Yeah. But I want you to understand this. Overall, the overall thing. Uh, when Paul addresses an issue in 1 Corinthians and says, this is my advice, he usually starts out by giving an ideal, and then he immediately, invariably, follows it up with equally valid alternatives. Remember, he is addressing a church where the haves compare themselves to the have-nots. And that's the haves in society, financially, but also spiritually. And he's trying to compare the, try, trying to speak to both uh, groups. You know, it is so easy it, 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 it is so easy to fall into the trap of seeing faith as a set of rules to follow. But as the saying goes, for every difficult problem, there is an easy and wrong <coughs> solution. Paul is, Paul's is not a rule-based morality. Rather, a, a range of responses is deemed as morally appropriate. So let's talk about one practical example. That is the Eucharist. In chapter 11, Paul addresses liturgical concerns, especially the Lord's Supper. Now we owe a great deal to the people in Corinth for being so dysfunctional. 
If they were not having issues with the Eucharist, we wouldn't know that Paul even knew about it. Because 1 Corinthians is the only letter that Paul even mentions the sacrament. So we owe a great deal of debt to these folks for being so screwed up. <laughs> That's going to be punted to the church history people. Uh, <laughs> We don't know. That's the bottom of my answer. We, we don't know uh, how the early apostolic succession came about because nothing was written down. And why was nothing written down? Because Christianity was an outlaw religion. Okay? They didn't start writing things down until after Constantine's conversion in the fourth century. So that's why we have this big gap between Scripture and 4th century writings. There, there are some writings of church fathers there, but they're, they're not real specific. Sorry, this is best I can do. Um, this is an interesting quote. It com comes from Paul Sampley. I, admit, re I referenced him in your handout. And this is what he said. For Paul, Participation in the Lord's Supper is the fundamental, even defining, community action of believers. Like no other activity, this fellowship epitomizes believers' relation to Christ and to one another in pristine clarity. Now, I would venture to guess that none of you have any issue with anything he says here. Would it surprise you to know that he's Protestant? That's real Catholic for a Protestant. So. Although we're more familiar with the gospel traditions of the Last Supper, it's actually 1 Corinthians 11, which is the earliest recording of what happened there. Why? Because Paul is writing 20 to 30 years before the gospel. going on down the hall today. <laughs> Good time. Downstairs. And it's probably all the snacks. That <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Need more sugar. sugar <laughs> <laughs> so let's read a very, you don't have to look it up. Let, let's read a very, very familiar passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 23. Oh, you're getting old here, take your glasses off to see that. <laughs> For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was handed over. Does this sound familiar? Mm -hmm. Took bread, and after he had given thanks, broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of you. In the same way also the cup after supper saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. It is vital that Catholics understand what Jesus says when he says, do this in remembrance of me. That, that is so important. That's why I'm repeating it. Most of the modern megachurches and all of those who trace their heritage to the more radical Anabaptist movement do not have altars in their worship spaces. Most modern mainstream Protestant churches do have altars, and if they have one, it is usually these words that are carved into it. On the other hand, most Protestants have no idea where their beliefs about the Lord's Supper, as they call it, come from. I know, because I was one. Most Protestant beliefs about the Eucharist come from Huldrych Zwingli. Ever heard of him? Zwingli was the leader of the more radical Swiss Reformation. So you have Luther in Germany, you have 
Calvin in Vienna, and you have Zwingli in Switzerland. And it was Huldrich Zwingli who sought to remove any idea of sacrifice from the Lord, Lord's Supper. He saw it as nothing more than a ritual, a memorial, instituted by Christ to help the faithful remember his sacrifice on the cross. I remember growing up Methodist, back then we actually had a communion rail, and you would kneel there, okay, and they would have a little, they looked like rabbit pellets. Uh, in, in there and little cups of grape juice. Okay? And I remember saying to myself, why does this help me remember what Christ did on the cross? I remember what Christ did on the cross. I don't need this to remind me. What's the point? Zwingli actually likened the Eucharist to a man leaving on a long journey and leaving behind a ring for his wife to remember him by. So the Eucharist is to remind us of Christ while he's gone between his first coming and his second coming. What Zwingli and those today who follow his teachings without knowing them, the way they erred is in their understanding of the Jewish concept of remembering. Hebrew word is the zikron, the equivalent Greek word is anamnesis. Anamnesis. I wish it would pronounce anamnesis, because that way you get the idea. Remember, amnesia is forgetting, and an is the opposite of that, so it's not forgetting. Got that? Not forgetting, remembering. Okay. Um, on the other hand, it doesn't re it doesn't mean bringing to mind, not forgetting. It refers not so much to a remembering of the past as to a representation of a past event. Let me explain further. In Psalms 106, we read, For their sake he, God, for their sake he remembered his covenant and relented in his abundant love. Isn't that a strange verb? Relent in love. That's not the point today, but it's something to think about. Well, what does it mean for God to remember his covenant? Had he forgotten about it? Does God have some kind of celestial dementia? Well, no. For God to remember his covenant is to take an old act and make it a present reality. Let me say that again. It's important. Let me say it again. Right? For a Jew, for God to remember his covenant is to say, this covenant that God made with my ancestors is just as valid today as it was back then. William Willimans, actually one of my favorite authors, has been for years. He was the former uh, chaplain at Duke University. He's actually a bishop in the Methodist Church. And this is what he says. To recall something in the liturgy, particularly for the Jews, is not to focus on the dead past. It is to proclaim its presently manifested power and our place within its present reality. He goes on to say, the remembering which takes place here is therefore more accurately understood as proclamation, remember we proclaim your death, or participation rather than just historical recollection. The Catholic Church has adopted the essence of the Jewish Passover. During a Passover Seder meal, Jews remember 
God's mighty works in delivering the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. And part of that meal is asking God for a similar deliverance from their present circumstance. Our celebration of the Eucharist remembers Christ's sacrifice on Calvary by re-presenting it to God and making this past event a present reality. You got that? So literally, when you are going up to receive the Eucharist, you are walking up to the foot of the cross. Literally. Walking up to the foot of the cross and receiving the benefits of Christ's sacrifice. You are taking a past event and making it a present reality. Making it applicable. Making it vitally important to what you do this coming week. Were the Lord's Supper merely a token meal, as Zwingli proclaimed, nothing more than a ritual designed to help us remember Jesus' sacrifice on Calvary, then there would have been no reason for Paul to write, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord unworthily will have to answer for the body and blood of the Lord. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment upon himself. That, by the way, is precisely why you can't receive the Eucharist unless you proclaim a Catholic understanding of the Eucharist. Because the church is really mindful of that and saying, we don't want to contribute to anyone's damnation. By the way, discerning the body is one of those double entendre things. Uh, obviously, discerning the body is all, it, it involves discerning the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. But if we also remember that Paul talks throughout 1 Corinthians about the body of Christ, it is discerning that the church is the body of Christ, that we are all linked together. It's addressing that horizontal issue as well as that vertical issue. Does that make sense? Now, as I said a couple of years ago, 1 Corinthians 13 although it's read as one of the readings at almost every wedding, is not about marital love. I'm sorry, it isn't. Sandwiched between 1 Corinthians 12, where Paul discusses the variety of spiritual gifts, and 1 Corinthians 14, the proper use of spiritual gifts in worship, we find chapter 13, which basically says, puts, puts spiritual gifts in focus, in perspective. Without love, spiritual gifts are of no benefit. We don't have time to go through that today. Sorry, we've got to get to second Corinthians. But I have put the salient points in your handout. Okay? So let's move on to second Corinthians, or as a wise man once said, two Corinthians. <laughs> Raymond Brown has this to say about 2 Corinthians. No other letter of Paul evokes so vividly the image of a suffering and rejected apostle, misunderstood by his fellow Christians. Let's give you a couple of examples. <clears throat> Chapter 4, Paul says, we, he by the way he uses we a lot in 2 Corinthians. We are afflicted in every way, but not constrained. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. Does that sound a little Jewish? I did. Can you just see Tevye doing that? It gets worse. Five times at the hands of the Jews, I received 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. That's Roman. Okay, The lashes is Jewish. The rods is Roman. Once I was stoned. 
Three times I was shipwrecked. I passed a night and a day on the deep. In toil and hardship, through many sleepless nights, through hunger and thirst, through frequent fastings, through cold and exposure. And apart from these things, there is the daily pressure upon me of my anxieties for all the churches. Don't you feel sorry for me? Boy, babe. <laughs> if you could just hear that, breathing through that. Well, why? Paul's a passionate man. He's given to a wide range of emotions. And within 2 Corinthians, we observe his anger and distress. And we also see his heartfelt affection for this church. Paul's self-descriptions are illuminating because they show a Paul who was not always victorious, not always triumphant, but often vexed, put upon, and at times almost overwhelmed. 2 Corinthians is Paul's most personal letter, most self revealing Now, the majority of scholars believe that 2 Corinthians is actually a compilation letter, that it's actually put together from fragments of other letters after Paul's death. And they range from a minimum of two letters to up to five letters. I would say the majority of scholars believe that at least there's two. Why do they say that? Well, I want you to notice how smoothly chapter 7, verse 5 flows into chapter 2, verse 13. I had no relief of my spirit because I did not find my brother Titus. So I took leave of him and went on to Macedonia. For even when we came into Macedonia, the flesh had no rest, but we were afflicted in every way. You notice how easily that smooth, that, that transitions there. But that's not where it is in the scripture. This is what it goes. Went on to Macedonia, but thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in the world. We change verses here. Change channel. And then equally, that doesn't fit either. Uh, the harsh tone of chapters 10 through 13 stand in stark contrast to the remainder of the text. Murphy O'Connor says it this way. I doubt that Paul would suddenly switch from the celebration of reconciliation in the first nine chapters to a savage reproach and sarcastic self-vindication in chapters 10 through 13. Something very serious must have happened in Corinth. So here's the proposed chronology of what happened. Paul wrote a letter to the church at Corinth, his first letter, which has been lost. We referred to that earlier. Sometime after the church received his second letter, what we call 1 Corinthians, right? Second letter, 1 Corinthians. Timothy arrived in Corinth and found the church in turmoil. And he traveled to Ephesus to tell Paul about it, and they both set off for Corinth. This second visit in Corinth was what Paul refers to as his painful visit, <coughs> during which time Paul was publicly humiliated by members of the Christian <coughs> church, and he left in a huff. In response, Paul wrote his third letter, which may be what we see in that harsh part of 2 Corinthians chapter 10 through 13. That is highly debated. So that was his third letter. Uh, and then he traveled from Ephesus to Macedonia, uh, where Titus reported to Paul that his third letter had been well received. Really? <coughs> Read chapters 10 through 13 and see if you would well receive it. Okay. Been well received by the Corinthian church and they had repented of their previous ill treatment of it and were seeking reconciliation. And in response then, Paul wrote a fourth letter to the Corinthians, which has been preserved in 2 Corinthians, probably in the part that's not chapters 10 through 13. Got that? Clear as mud? Like I said, scholars have to do something. Uh, the feeling is that the majority of 2 Corinthians, the good part, the nice part of it, the fourth letter, was probably written in the fall of 57 AD to set the stage for Paul spending the winter of 57 58 in Corinth. We know he did that. That Titus reports Corinthians. Do we have a one? I, we have a letter to Titus. Do we have one? 
No, 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 no. In 2 Corinthians, Paul refers to, and Titus told me that. Oh, okay. Okay, sorry, I didn't put that up there. Okay. Yeah, that, that's, that's where they get that from. Okay. Paul refers to Titus reporting that you want to get together, that sort of thing. It, it, it's kind of like working a jigsaw puzzle, you know, it really is. You kind of take this first, you get that inside, you get this one, kind of put it all together, and there's a few pieces missing. <laughs> Let's take a little bit closer look uh, at chapter 5. Chapter 5, verse 1. For we know that if our earthly dwelling of a tent should be destroyed, we have a building from God, a dwelling not made with hands, eternal in heaven. You've probably heard that read in here. I want to relate that to what we talked about last fall related specifically to John's Gospel, the prologue, chapter 1, where John talks about the word dwelling, made his dwelling. And I will, if you recall, the word dwelling is equivalent to tabernacle. I would also relate that to what we talked about last time in Revelation chapter 20 where in the new heaven, the new Jerusalem, the new earth, God comes and dwells with his people. I would also remind you that there's, that there's an analogy here between <coughs> the tent, that is, the tabernacle in the wilderness, and a dwelling not made with hands, that is, the true temple in heaven that is reflected in the Jerusalem temple. Got that? All fits together. Later he says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive recompense according to what he did in the body, body again, whether good or evil. Let's go on Sampley. Remember, he's a Protestant. What he writes about this. The judgment will not be on what one believes or whether one has the right idea. The judgment will not be levied on one's faith because faith is a free gift from God. The judgment, Paul expects, is focused on the works faith has produced in the individual's life. We're going to talk about that a lot next time. I will tell you that when I was going through RCIA, not only did I read the catechism cover to cover, including the footnotes, but I reread most of the Bible. I, I kind of got bogged down in some of the Old Testament. I certainly read all of the deuterocanonical works, reread the first five books, and I read all the New Testament. And every once in a while, I would come across a verse, and I would go. And I put a little star by it. That was one of the stars. That was. I don't remember that. Before. We're going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ, and we're going to be judged on what we did with our lives. We're going to talk about that much more next month, so stay tuned. How about chapter, verse 17? So whoever is in Christ is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now, uh, Sampley says that that two-word construction, <coughs> new creation, captures the whole of Paul's gospel. It expresses redemption as a kind of creation made new. On the other hand, N.T. Wright adds, Paul is not just speaking of the individual Christian as a new creation, but of the entire renewal of the cosmos in which the Christian is invited to participate. We touched on that a little bit when we studied the good news of Revelation. We're going to talk about that again next month. 
when we talk about the new perspective of Paul, and that is, contrary to popular belief, the message of the New Testament is not, how do I get to heaven? It is not about the salvation of the individual. It is about God putting things right. Individually, collectively, all of creation. That at the final judgment, we're going to come full circle and end up right back in the Garden of Eden where we started. Dwelling with God. Interacting one-on-one. -on -one not hiding in the bushes. Now, as I said before, uh, chapters 10 through 13 are referred to as the harsh part of 2 Corinthians. Whether they comprise the tearful letter that Paul refers to, for out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote to you with many tears, not that you might be pained, but that you might know the abundant love I have for you. It's kind of like the parents saying, this is going to hurt me more than it does you. And we all didn't buy that. <laughs> but that's kind of what he says. But then, uh, some people believe that chapters 10 through 13 represent this tearful letter that he refers to in chapter 2. And some say, no, nah, I don't think it's not worth it. Um, Whatever the chronology, Sam Lee says, some Corinthians, this is another issue here, some Corinthians have come to believe that Paul's fiduciary relations are problematic. Maybe I should explain that. Okay, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul says this. And I make a mistake when I humble myself so that you might be exalted. Because I preach the gospel of God to you without charge. I plundered other churches by accepting from them in order to minister to you. And when I was with you and in need, I did not burden anyone, for the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my needs. So I refrained and will refrain from continue, continue to refrain from burdening, burdening you in any way. Let me explain. In this culture, if you are well off, it is standard for you to be a patron to somebody who's doing great things so that they're kind of answering to you. If that doesn't ring any bells to our current situation in this life, you need to more paying attention. But it was standard for people to accept the patronage of the well-off. And Paul, when he lived with them for a year and a half, rejected that. He didn't accept their patronage. And they were offended by it. We can understand it from Paul's perspective, but from their perspective, it was a slap in the face. It was even more a slap in the face because when he wasn't taking their money, he was taking money from these folks from Macedonia. What was that all about? Okay? And then he comes back and he says in 1 Corinthians, What then is my recompense? That when I preach, I offer the gospel free of charge so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. And yet in 2 Corinthians, as in a lot of his later letters, he is talking to them about contributing to a collection that he plans to take back to the church in Jerusalem. Okay. And he tells them how wonderful the Macedonians are because they've contributed to this collection. And how wonderful the Philippians are because they've contributed to this collection. And what are you going to do? Pony up. And they're basically saying, you're being two-faced here. First you say you preach the gospel free of charge and then you ask for money. We're not going into Surely you never get letters from religious people asking for money. <laughs> <laughs> yes? This is my first uh, class of this type. Obviously, I'm at a disadvantage. But I just wanted to know, literally, 
who, if there was no pastor at the Corinthian church, how did the, how were these letters read to the Corinthian people? I mean, well, it doesn't mean that there weren't leaders. There just wasn't a designated pastor. So, the, the, so he the literally sent the leader and they. And no, he just sent that. He sent it to the church. The letter is addressed to the church, and it's entrusted to these three folks that I mentioned at the beginning, okay. and they carried uh, it back to the church. And then it was read okay. aloud. We have to remember that all of the New Testament was written to be heard, not read, okay? Because the majority of the population was illiterate; they couldn't read it. So you had to have somebody in the church who could be able to read the letter, and they read it aloud to the church. Okay, but the Corinthian church in the first century did not have a pastor; it was a spirit-led church, and it was a mess because they couldn't get anywhere because people kept speaking in tongues and then giving prophecies and all of this, and it was just a garbage just a mess, and nothing ever got accomplished. And then you had the the rich folks showing up early and eating all the Lord's Supper. <laughs> So that the working class who got there later, there wasn't anything left for them. It was a really dysfunctional church. We don't have time to get into all that. It really was. Okay. And so, yeah, it was a spirit-led church. Okay. Uh, have you ever been to a Pentecostal service? No. Yeah. <laughs> That's a jealous period. You've got to go there. I went to a, an Assembly of God funeral for one of my patients little boy that died of a brain tumor. I went to his funeral. It lasted two and a half hours. There were people speaking in tongues and there was people standing up and interpreting tongues and there was this long, long, ridiculously long sermon. Then they had an altar call where you could come up and give your life to Christ. This is all in a funeral. It is a different experience. When I was, one of the things they did when I was in MYF, that's Methodist Youth Fellowship, kind of like CYO, except now it's CY what? Yeah. 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 We went to a bunch of different churches. We actually went to Mass. Uh, but one of the places we went was called a Four Square Gospel Church. <laughs> we, I heard an hour and a half sermon on Zacchaeus. I don't know how you put together an hour and a half sermon on Zacchaeus. <laughs> you say the same thing over and over and over and over again. And it was unair conditioned. And I had a full bladder. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a it was a poor church. They did not have any restrooms. I remember that night. To this day. I'm sorry I digress. Excuse me. Yes. Wasn't that impossible? That wasn't in his agenda at that point. But I don't see how they could have been. Well, because you're approaching it from our our side of the capital trend. Okay? You're looking at it going that way. They're looking at it going this way. It wasn't really that clear. Um, chapter 12. Chapter 12 includes Paul's discussion of the thorn in the flesh. If, you ever want, if you're ever playing Bible Bowl and you want, they say, well, where did Paul talk about his thorn in the flesh? It's 2 Corinthians chapter 12. That I might not become too elated. I like that. Too elated. A thorn in the flesh was given to me, an angel of Satan, to beat me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I begged the Lord about this, that I might, it might leave me, but he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. That's a great statement. I really like that. And the scholars debate what his thorn in the flesh was. I've heard everything from psoriasis to a nagging wife. That's probably not a lie. <laughs> There's no evidence for it there. But I've heard that, you know. Uh, scabies. Sciatic, uh, I mean, it, it, there's all sorts of things. The point is this interaction with God. But I would point out again to you that the translation committee put in the punctuation marks. Okay? 
But he said to me, quote, my grace is sufficient to you, for you. Now the question is, where does God stop talking and Paul start talking again? Is it the way it says here? That God said, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. Or did it stop there? God said, my grace is sufficient for you. And then Paul, editorial-wise, adds, for power is made perfect in weakness. Yeah, it's different. It's not real different. It's not a big deal. But it does point out the issue. There's a big issue, by the way. What's the most famous verse in the New Testament? That's the word. Right. Okay. John chapter 3, verse 16. Who's talking there? We don't know. Okay. Uh, we don't know because if you follow the conversation from the thing up there, you can't figure out when Jesus stops talking and John starts talking. If you look in the King James Version in those Bibles that have Jesus' words in red letters, First uh, John 3.16 is in red. Jesus is saying that. If you look in the New American Bible, the quote ends, and it's the author saying, for God's sake, the Lord. One of those things. It's, it's the audacity of being able to determine the words of Jesus. That is, that is really proud. Sorry, I digress. Uh, Sambly says that some in Corinth want to test Paul, apparently in regard to his apostleship. So Paul can no longer avoid a confrontation. And he projects a third visit, a showdown an encounter in which he and they can sort out their differences and he can assert his authority. We don't know if that happens or what happens. By the way, the final verse in 2 Corinthians, you all know because you hear it frequently. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. And for Catholics, it's just so hard not to respond. <laughs> it's kind of like the dum da da dum dum. <laughs> but the next time you hear that in Mass, know that the priest is quoting 2 Corinthians. And after Mass, you can ask the priest, did you know you were quoting 2 Corinthians? <laughs> if you were braver than I. Okay. Any more questions? Did I finish early? Um, I think we went over a tad. Oh. <laughs> well, that's normal. I, 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 didn't, I didn't want to interrupt. It was too good. Okay, next time. Next time we're going to talk about something relatively new, like it's within the last 20 years, and it's called the new perspective of Paul. If you want to prepare for that, read Romans and Galatians and expect to be confused. Excuse me, read what? Romans and Galatians. Galatians is Romans light. <laughs> That's an oversimplification, but he's talking about the same issue. And the new perspective on Paul is not everything about Paul, it's specifically about how Paul addresses. Well, I'll just tell you. How is, how is it that Jesus' death on the cross saves? How does that work? That's what we're going to talk about next time. Thank you, Dr. Walsh.